Welcome to The Writing Life, the podcast for anyone who writes. I'm Steph McKenna. And I'm James Gill. From the National Centre for Writing here at Dragon Hall in Norwich, England. In this episode, we speak to novelist and NCW tutor Megan Bradbury, who gives us a wealth of great advice to help you build your writing routine. We cover a lot of ground in this discussion, the focus of which is removing mental, physical and even temporal blocks to get you writing, from tackling your own avoidance excuses to noise-cancelling headphones. And I have to say, honestly, this this conversation has been a total game changer for me. Um, I spoke to Megan, it was a few weeks ago now, and I have to say, I have since started my story and I'm up to 40,000 words, Steph. That's amazing. So this, this is a blinder. God, Megan's so good, isn't she? Many of you will already know Megan from the podcast, and it was a pleasure to welcome her back. Megan's a longtime friend of us, having won a place on Escalator, our talent development programme. Megan also won a grant for the arts to help fund the completion of her first novel, Everyone is Watching, which is absolutely brilliant. Megan is also one of our online course tutors. What online courses I hear you say? Well, the National Centre for Writing has a variety of online learning activities, from courses to mentorship and workshops. Head to our website to browse free short courses, in-person classes and workshops, and our much-loved 12- and 18-week tutored online courses, which are developed in partnership with the University of East Anglia. These courses have been designed specifically to get you writing. That's right. Our beginners and intermediate courses contain practical exercises, class discussions, and you'll receive one-to-one feedback on your work every two weeks. If there's a story inside you burning away, this is the course to get you writing it. But it's a big decision. So head to the website to watch our introduction videos, including tutors, uh, as well as videos from former students describing their own experiences. There are also detailed course breakdowns. Check it out. And now, without further delay, we bring you the marvellous Megan Bradbury. So thanks so much for joining us um, today. We're going to have a great, great conversation uh, basically about building, building a writing routine, helping people get into the groove and deploying all of the wisdom and stuff that they've been Googling and hopefully listening to on the podcast. So just to kick off, though, do tell us, give us a bit about a little potted history of your experience, how you came to writing and what you're doing at the moment. Oh, gosh, yeah. Well, I'll try and sum it up. It's been a, a, long, a long journey. Yes, so I've been writing for a long time. Since the age of 10, we'll start there. That's a good, a good uh, timeline. Um, something I've always been interested in. When I was at the point where I was going to university and deciding what I wanted to study, I very much, having not written probably throughout my teenage years, spending my time, as most teenagers do, doing other things, um, decided to uh, give it a go. And I took up, actually, what was the course that the Writer Centre and the courses that they run Previously, the uh, UEA ran similar adult education courses in the evening. For you'd, you'd study for a diploma or a certificate in a certain subject, um, and I took one of those um, in creative writing when I did my A levels, just to sort of try out and see if I still enjoyed it as much as I did as a ten year old, and really loved it. So I applied to university and studied at university, then studied it. Um, so I studied for a BA and then an MA, um, and then went away full of theory and knowledge, but not much of a, an idea about what interested me. So I went off and kind of uncovered that a bit and really began in earnest and with true dedication probably in about mm, 2008 I think really was when I really committed to it and and um, scheduled writing time and kind of was quite serious about it. I published my first novel in 2016 and I've worked in other ways with my writing, collaborating uh, collaborating with other artists on writing projects and commissions, little, uh, kind of smaller projects. And I'm working on my second novel now, which is going well, I think. Who knows? <laughs> Someone else to tell me that. But this subject's really important to me because for me, the key to all of this, the key to kind of actually sitting down and taking my writing seriously and having the space to put into practice all the theory that I'd studied and, and learnt and acquired throughout my university years was was scheduling time, was actually sitting down and deciding that if I wanted to do this properly, I had to do this properly. I had to actually take it seriously. I had to stop kind of feeling like... I think up to that, up to that point, I've, I've always enjoyed it, but perhaps haven't felt confident in really dedicating time because it's not, it's not until you start sacrificing other things to do the writing that you... I think make that step will cross that line so really for me a, a crucial year in my kind of writing life is 2008 when um, my husband and I we stayed for a few months in uh, New York and just sort of bumbled around there kind of writing it was absolutely brilliant and then came back and we moved from Norwich to Edinburgh which was um, just because we wanted to experience another city we'd never 
we had no knowledge, no friends, no, no kind of connection with the city, but it, we went and visited it and liked it very much. And it was, for me, that disconnect with my usual routine and usual environment, um, being in a new place, having had this amazing time in another country, another city, where everything kind of came together for me. I found my subjects and I found the environment. You know, living in Edinburgh is absolutely a massive part of my kind of journey, I guess. As is, is a meeting a good, who's now a good friend of mine, but at the time I, I met up with a, another writer who had just recently moved to Edinburgh, who was working on her PhD and a novel. And through talking to her, she encouraged me to start using the National Library of Scotland to, as a place to work, just because I had lots of, lots of research to do and you know, not necessarily a place to sort of dedicate my time and sit down and work. So she encouraged me. And the idea of, um, the idea of going to a library like that, which is a very serious library, research library, it seemed completely ludicrous to me at the beginning because I thought, well, that, this is for proper scholars, this is for proper writers, that's not me. Um, but she really encouraged me to do it. And so I started working in the National Library of Scotland and that just completely changed everything for me. It was an incredible experience um, having access to all the sources they had there, but also just being in that environment with other, other scholars, uh, people studying all kinds of subjects, um, was really inspiring. So once I started using that library, that's when I started scheduling time. I... Uh, I had quite a number of jobs and not a lot of time, which meant I had to be quite organised about it. So I would schedule time for the. I used to, I worked in. I worked, did shift work in a box office in Edinburgh, and so I would do a lot of evening shifts. So I would schedule my time in the day to go to the library, do have many hours of work, and then go to work. And I did that, you know, with the weekends as well. And it was. It was. Um, I'd never done that before. Um, and it sounds like such a simple thing. Like why? Why would you not just schedule time or use a library? Surely that's what people do. But it's such a big step to consider yourself kind of good enough or important enough or serious enough to do that. Uh, and so also you have a, you're one of our tutors um, yeah. on, on the course here. Give us a bit of an, an idea of uh, your involvement on, um, on the course. Yeah, so I've taught a number of courses for the National Centre for Writing, some of their beginner prose fiction course, um, but the one I, I teach most regularly is the intermediate level, which is the fiction next steps. And that's for writers who have a bit of experience with writing, but they want to take, you know, take that journey further and, and really get um, more of an in-depth exploration of, of their interests and their writing styles. Um, so I've been teaching on that course for a couple of years now. And the course is really fantastic. I think there's, it has such a good balance of advice and theoretical learning and practical application. The course is also great because you get feedback um, every two weeks. So that's something I think that most of the writers who are on the course really benefit from the most is, is this interaction, not just with me as a tutor, but with the other students. Um, they have the forum online to share their work, share their exercises, but also their assignments as well. And that's something that all the tutors do is encourage the writers to participate and talk very actively about one another's work. So it's, it's really rewarding. And, the, and the, the, we talk about all sorts of things. So the, the online course structure you know, has, has the written text that the students are encouraged to read. But all the tutors will have their own personal preferences for sources and, and advice. So it's, it's every, every course is very different. Um, it's very personalised to the tutor teaching it. But also, obviously, the writers who are engaging with that course bring, bring lots to it as well. So, um, you know, the, the learning and the reading and the writing is very much guided by what the writers are interested in and the sorts of writing they do. So it's I, I, I find it really rewarding because you don't know where it's going to go next. And there's always a you know an issue that will that will become very kind of heated and, and engrossing, um, you know, about point of view or <laughs> kind of all these things. Which and it's so wonderful to see writers actually unlocking. I, I spoke a minute ago about how for me the unlocking moment is is taking that step and treating yourself seriously, scheduling that time for your own work. But for other writers, it's different things. So for some people, it might be, oh, oh, I realise that you can do this with this particular point of view and this is a voice I feel really, you know, akin to. I'm going to try this. And, and you see it, you see the work improving. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's brilliant. And you're like, yes, that's your moment. You've done it. You've done that. You mentioned there, uh, he's always sort of got into a bit of, of writing routine. Yeah. And now I, I'm going to ask a, probably again, a very basic question, but it's one that obviously everyone listening will know what the word r routine means and what the word writing means and what you know, a writing routine, but kind of what specifically does it cover? Because everyone listening and, and myself are thinking, oh, it's, it's a cording off of a time, but it's, Tell me, what, what do we mean by writing routine? Is it sort of the kit, the time, the yeah. mindset? What, what's involved it's, in that phrase? It's all of that. And, and I think what, the reason why I was kind of put off 
by it all for a very long time is this is this commitment aspect I thought that to write a book or to write seriously you needed to be doing it full time you needed to be you know, going to an office at nine o'clock, sitting down at a desk, writing for eight hours, come out, you know, and at the end of a few months, you'd have a novel. Clearly, that's not how it works. And I realise that's not how it works. Um, and I'm relieved, actually, because that would be quite a hideous existence, I think, if that was all that one did. I think a routine is different for everybody. I think regardless of what time you have available to you and what pressures of time, whether that be work or family or education, or if you have um, certain, you know, certain other pressures in your life that needs attending to scheduling time is important because it's not it's not even really about the time then that you acquire it's the the, having made that decision to put to put the time in it's it's a psychological thing you have put time aside you also have put up maybe a sign to other people in your life whether that's family or friends or whoever that this time is your time that you will not move these you know stakes in the ground this is for me this this is this is where I'm going to do my work and that's really important and I think for lots of people particularly for lots of women with families where their time is is really you know eaten into you know in a positive way but also also not always in a positive way um it's really important to be quite vocal about what is your time and what isn't your time and a routine really you know it can be anything for for anybody you know to be a writer or to take these sort of next steps in your writing you don't have to write every day I don't write every day I don't always write every month it depends on what my working schedule is like and you can keep a toe in all the time. And I've learned, I mean, I've had throughout, you know, the past 20 years, I've had um, times where I've had lots of time for writing. Um, so after my after living in Edinburgh for a while, my husband and I were able to live for a year in his mum's basement in Cornwall, having saved a bit of money to live off and to care for her. And we, we had basically a year to, to write with no work. I mean, that's the, only, that's the only time that's ever happened. You know, that's the first time that's ever happened in my life. And that was incredible. So, I, you know, that was wonderful. And you can schedule your time. That is not a realistic... Um, <laughs> that was, I've never been able to do that since. And certainly not now with two uh, small kids under the age of five. So, so for me, my time is probably quite representative of most people. I have a young family. I have other work. I've, I've talked about my tutoring work, but I also mentor writers as well and do other writing commissions. So the writing time I have um, is not as vast as it used to be, but you can keep it in your mind. I think this is important to remember that writing time is not just the time you're sitting at a desk putting words on a page. It's thinking time as well. So I've learned certain strategies, particularly since my daughter was born last year, she's 10 months now, that that you have to actively keep a toe in. So, for example, I'll do things like I'll listen to old drafts of my writing, whatever my current project is. I'll listen to them via an app called Speechify. And there are lots of different apps which will read your work aloud to you. So I do that when she's sleeping in the pushchair and I'm taking her for a walk to keep her asleep. I will listen to that. Um, and obviously I'm not editing, I'm not doing anything to it, I'm not adding to it, but I'm listening to it, I'm thinking about, you know, the sequencing of the passages, I'm thinking about, oh, God, that's waffly, I need to cut that back um, down, or there's a bit I haven't really gone into there. And I'm not making notes about that, I'm just thinking about it at the moment, and then when I have the time to sit down with the, you know, document, with the manuscript, I can, I tend to remember what what I need to do. And that's been great. And it's kind of like it's uh, like this weird, like perverse little treat where I'm like, I'm going to go for a walk for an hour and, and listen to this awful draft that is grammatically incorrect. And it's full of spelling mistakes. So it's quite funny because you hear the person reading it with all these awful um, mistakes in it. That's a real treat to me now. Like, so I think people, you know, there are things like that that you can do. But what's key is to not be is to not feel that you have to spend every day writing is to not feel stressed by the time that you have is is being realistic about what time you have and then being quite open to using that time so i wonder as well and again this doubtless is almost more one of the, the most personal areas where people will assemble things that are different um, and the, the things that work differently for them yeah. is it useful to have a goal or an aim or a, a, a an output in mind because for me the stress would be i've just got to sit down and produce something whereas if i know uh, I'm, I'm going to either, whether it's 400 words, whether it's yeah. um, get X character from A to B, yeah. how do broad goals, every day I do X, or at least setting a goal ahead of time, is yeah. that something that's important to that yeah, routine? I think it's I think it's important, but it can be, um, it depends what motivates you. So I know lots of people for whom word count's very important. Um, and, you know, they'll, 
they'll say, well, I want to write a thousand words, 500 words a day or, you know, every other day or every week. Um, that's not something that I, I don't use that myself as a goal because for me, I can, I can write thousands of words in a day. Like I write really fast, but it's awful. So for me, my kind of judgment of whether I've done well is not really the word count because it could be any, it's about, have I really got there there's there's a kind of a quality or something that I um so I mean I'm working on a novel so I've been working on this for years I'm at the stage of this novel where it what I'm working on is very particular and I can pinpoint exactly what I need to do this isn't representative of writing generally if I'm at the beginning of a project it will be much more woolly so my goals might be well I'm going to sit down for you know this time this length of time and try and use it as effectively as possible it won't it won't it won't be um too defined but as a project becomes kind of bigger and easier to understand then my goals will be more specific so right now for me it's a question of oh you know I'm going through the draft I've segmented it into sections each time I sit down I'm going to look at a new section figure out what I need to do and then for the next few weeks or however long it takes I'll just be working on that small piece and once that's done I'll put that away and look at the next section so I do I do often I think it's important to have like a strategy mm. because um, the first thing is scheduling the time so you've got the time the second thing is being prepared for that time so what I would advise people to do is to use that writing time efficiently make sure you've done everything you need to do before you sit down so that you don't spend all that time you know Sharpening your pencil. Sharpening your pencil, getting your files in order, doing the research reading that you could have done them, you know, in the evening when you're a bit tired. I think that's important. So there are there are tasks that you can do to get yourself ready so that when you sit down, you're just ready to go um, and you can be more, you know, efficient. So that would be one thing. And then the question is, you know, what motivates you? So if you're motivated by you know, numbers that you can... In fact, I know lots of people at university, there are lots of writers there who plot their word count on a graph to, to, to see. I would never do that. It takes too much time for me. But some people are motivated by that. It gets them, you know, to sit down. It gets them to produce the work. Um, otherwise, it might be, well, I know I've got this scene that I am sort of interested in and I'm going to sit down and I'll sketch like a first draft. I've got a couple of hours, I'll sketch a first draft. And then maybe the next time you sit down, it's, well, now I'll read it back and I'll polish it a bit or see what's missing, I'll add that in. And then the next time you sit down, I'll, I'll, I'll edit it a bit and see. So it's breaking it down into goals, I think. Some people will be working on short stories, others people will be working on longer projects. And being organised about how you approach it is important. So breaking things down into manageable tasks, mm. basically, rather than going, oh, I'm sitting down, now I'm going to write my novel. Oh, God, no, how do I do that? Because that isn't going to... You're not going to do it in two hours. You need to... So I think perhaps for anyone who's embarking on a big project like that, it's important to spend some time, and I mean like a few weeks, sitting down and actually thinking about how you're going to approach it. Like anyone would do if they're planning, you know, a PhD or, or an essay or, or something like that. How would you go about your research if you need to do research? What things are you going to look at first? And just sort of have a plan so that you can rely on that, you know, each time you sit down, you've got something to work from. For me, it's about what is the bite-sized chunk? Yeah. And I'd say, again, a lot of my um, uh, sort of analogies are from, from music, but DJ Shadow on, has an album called The Mountain Will Fall. Okay. Um, and the phrase comes from this idea that when you're, you're making an album or, or doing a novel, it's, the, it's a mountain, right? It's 70,000 words, 100,000 words yeah. plus, etc. How are you possibly going to be able to dislocate your jaw like a snake and get this giant <laughs> item inside you? Um, and of course, again, it's a, it's a cliche and it's obvious, but it's, it's, you, you climb a mountain just like you do going to the toilet. It's a step at a time. But as long as you know what each tiny step is, you can yeah. digest those things. God, I'm mashing the metaphors together with that. That's but, fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, snake very, eating very a visual, mountain, like right? <laughs> <laughs> but that, that idea, and I think, mm. is that something that by breaking down, mm. uh, it's the fear of the blank page. It's like, yes, I, I don't want, yeah. I don't cordon off myself an hour tomorrow night because I don't even know what I'm going to do. Yeah. Um, whereas if you say, I've got my spreadsheet, or whether it's in your mind, yeah. you just know you've got to get yourself from A to B, and it's totally manageable within an hour. And suddenly, before you know, it, you've done that for three months, and you're well on your way. Yeah. Exactly. And it's, it's about anything that makes the experience less ethereal and woolly and, you know, driven by a muse and all this kind of stuff. And I always thought that was the case, which was why I didn't, I wasn't overly productive because I was waiting for, you know, lots of writers would talk about, oh, suddenly I had this voice in my head and the character just took me. That has never happened to me. I don't think it will because I don't think that way. For me, I have to actively 
do it and find it and write it. I, I don't have thoughts and then I write them down. I have the thoughts while I'm writing. The writing is the thinking. That's, that's, that's what I've learned. But I didn't know that before. And it's well, well and good for me to say that. That might not be everyone's process. But I think, I think attacking it like that in a way that makes the act very ordinary... Another thing I do uh, with a friend of mine who's a poet and she has lots of projects and she has lots of work, she's very busy. Years ago, this is when my husband and I went to Cornwall to to write and look after his mother, I was terrified of wasting this time because it's such an opportunity. So I arranged with my friend that each week we would uh, share an e- have an email exchange where we would list all the things in that week that we would do and then each week we would review what we did and write a list for the next week. I have to say I've got out of the habit of doing this since the children because of the children so I feel bad but at that time it's absolutely crucial and part of our reasoning behind this was that on this list we would so we would include writing goals you know I'm going to look at this chapter I'm going to write 5,000 words I'm going to write you know do this but also it was you know remember to put the recycling out buy a new pair of shoes to replace ones with holes in like really ordinary everyday domestic activities and that to me was brilliant because it meant it wasn't special. The writing was something to do. And of course it feels special. And of course it's important. But I, I can't think about it like that. Because as soon as I think about it like that, it feels unobtainable and difficult. You describe, and I think I'm the same, where word count is not a problem for me. I just yeah. blast it out. It's not all brilliant, needs editing. But it's the bit that gets you to the ethereal bit. So it's and I, or, lots of these conversations that I've been having about whether it's plot and story or um, various aspects of writing is about there is the kind of the muse and the ethereal and the magic and the getting in the zone, mm-hmm. but actually there's nuts and bolts. Yeah. And it's where those two yeah. things meet. They're not mutually exclusive, but they overlap and everyone's different. So is yes, you can't just wait for the lightning bolt from God, but at the same time, you can't just mechanically sit down and write. Yeah. Although... Yeah mapping those two things i'm sorry i'm hopping to another point as well as um that uh and i'm sorry i forget who it is who said it but if you if you write if you just write every day even if you write nonsense if you journal if you describe the the brickwork the the actual act of writing kind of becomes easy so then you're able to just do the thinking about what you're writing because the writing is kind of fluid um and so that there's value in just writing um because it's like any muscle you get kind of match fit so it becomes uh, becomes easier but again that's subjective i don't know if that's no it's exactly that's exactly right and it's interesting your kind of physical analogy because this is the same this is exactly the same I started, uh, I took up long distance, well, it's not long distance running. I mean, it's running, it's not, <laughs> certainly not long distance running. But about the same time, when I moved to Edinburgh, you're in a new environment, inspired by all these new things. I'm like, I need to get fit, I need to stop smoking, I need to cut down my drinking and start running, which is what I did. And I realised it's, it's the same. So I'm, I'm out of the habit, clearly, at the moment. Um, but I love running. And But what it it, it feels like, so with, with running, obviously, you have to um, build up to doing it you have to do it very steadily but in any run in any case you have your warm-up and then you have the running bit and then for me there's there's maybe like a a three four minute window in a run right in the middle where it feels amazing and you're like oh my god I love the world and I everything is brilliant and I'm so great and the world is great and that's inside my head clearly if you saw me running that would not be what you (laughs) you would think I was thinking um and to me that is writing is the same so I'm like you I I write very fast I do a lot of free writing. That's pretty much um, my method for any any first draft or early draft of something is just free writing. I don't I don't pre plan, and then I deal with the mess that I've created. That's tend to be how I work. Um, but I find it, it took me a while to use that as a as a method because you have to physically begin and you have to let yourself go enough, but stay on track with the subject that you're dealing with it's kind of this mixture thing what you say between um finding the muse and being kind of quite organized but it's like that that point in running where you've got there because you've done the sort of training for it um and 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 then this sort of magic feeling is out of your control um but it is certainly experienced and so that's how i feel about writing um even bad drafts there's a point in there i mean a lot of it is nonsense and a lot of it has to be cut out but there'll be something in there and that's because you've written past the censor, you've written past all the kind of doubts, self-doubt that you, that you ha- that everyone has, um, and you've allowed that to come out. And, and that that was a massive uh, realisation for me. I'd never done that before. I was always worried about making a mess. I wanted a you know, pat on the back. I was a good student. I you know did my work, wrote my notes, wrote these kind of 
capable but very dull essays and, and writing projects they weren't particularly interesting but I'd never kind of mined deeply enough um because obviously you're worried about you know what on earth would come out I don't know <laughs> um and I think that's so important and when so when I'm teaching um the students uh, the, the writers on the on the course but also with the writers who I mentor quite often the key to unlocking all of this is to try and bypass all of the thought and all of the um conscious thought and try and get into what what it is that is that moves them what what it is that people are you know inspired by and they might not know that but I think lots of these methods the the scheduling of the time the writing through the consciousness of 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 the self not to feel feel sort of Freudian about it but but trying to get in there um really makes a difference um and getting kind of students to play and be um, imaginative and just have fun just to lark about to not care about what's being written um and as soon as that the kind of the mask drops and and people are having fun then it then it it really makes a difference it's so exciting to see it do you remember when christian bale kicked off at that lighting guy do you remember that the audio that surfaced and of course um you're like god this you know awful what what a a nasty piece of work (laughs) and i think it's interesting that uh, and I'm not making excuses for that behaviour, but um, hear me out, um, is... I'm sure Chris would appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, well, me and Chris, yeah. Oh, yeah, way back. Is when there is so much pressure on a moment in time to deliver um, a particular thing, and there's so many things sort of hanging on it, and you've, you know, you, you, your nose is clear, and you don't have a headache, and you've just been to the toilet, and everything's perfect... Is that what we do? I feel it a little when I'm writing. It's like, right, I've got to get the right music. Oh, God, the weather's in my right temperature. Have I just had a tea? Have I been to the toilet? There's, I feel like there's too much of that. And I can't remember again where I read it or heard it, but is just kind of don't build yourself too many rules. It's good to have a routine, but don't say, oh, well, I can't write if I haven't had tea or I can't write if it's the wrong temperature. You can write anywhere. You can write on anything. Is, is that your... Yeah. your Exactly, and and everyone will have preferences for what they do, and there are certain things that that there are certain things that can encourage you. So I I feel that way about gadgetry. I quite like gadgetry. I have um I have lots of devices. My poor husband, he's very tolerant. But um so I use like a I have a manual type typewriter, which is like for my for like fun for fun things. If I you know want to make a noise, I have that, and I have um. Uh, an, an electric typewriter which is which is what I use mostly actually for first drafts because you can't do anything else on it you can write very quickly and I, I prefer typing to handwriting I don't really the the slowness of handwriting prevents me from thinking fast so I need to think fast so I have certain things like that so of course if um if I need to write something down I won't not do it because I don't have the right devices but those devices because they excite me because I'm a bit of a geek they bring me to the desk. So there are certain things like that that can that can be helpful. And it sounds frivolous and it sounds, you know, ridiculous in a way, but why not? It, it, there's, a, there's a kind of a, you know, these are like um, sort of magic articles, you know, like a, if someone's laptop is has that effect on them um, because they enjoy the experience of using something like that, then then use it, They're, that's fine. But you don't want those things to get in the way. So you're right, all this stuff, oh, you know, I need to clean the house first, or I need to do that. I mean, God, don't ever clean the house first, never do that. I mean, obviously it'll be nice to write in a clean house, but that will never happen. Or that's not for me, that's just never going to happen. Um, I, I, so, so yeah, so do do things that kind of bring you to the, the desk, but, but be wary of that because that is pro- procrastination. And quite often it's because you're, worried or fearful about sitting down and the only way to get over that really is to make it habit to to make it kind of unspecial to make it ordinary um so what could that mean that could mean doing it you know 10 minutes a day half an hour a day half an hour a week it doesn't really matter as long as kind of it becomes part of your muscle memory and and you you just do it without thinking that's the goal um, and there are certain things. So I, another thing I do, which is I would recommend anyone with kids to, to have a really good pair of noise cancelling earphones. It's really, really important, and they've saved they've saved my sanity. And it's got to the point now where actually I find it difficult to write productively without them on, even if I'm in a quiet room or um, you know in a cafe or something. I need to, I, I like quite like feeling like you're in a sort of a cocoon. Interesting as well with the the sport uh, metaphor is. And again, maybe most people listening will will have already experienced this, but is that it does it get easier that actually the first time you sit down and put, you know, um, chapter one paragraph in and your first word, 
that it gets easier and, and you yeah. the more you do it is is that kind of almost universally true that actually you've just got to break through it's absolutely. not always going to be a grind no absolutely i would i i when i look back now i don't know quite how i stuck with it given how unpleasurable i found it to be honest um because because i would do all that stuff and what i would do is sit down and write in the way i thought writers wrote which was not my way but this imagined thing um, but also try somehow to recreate a finished piece by sitting down with a blank page and starting. So this is uh, uh, this is just part of my character. I remember when I did my art GCSE, my art teacher at the time would say, like, you need to make preparatory sketches for this thing you're going to, the final project, you need to do it. And I would never did. I never did. I would instantly try and draw, you know, a line, outline, perfect outline of this thing I'm trying to write. I never, uh, trying to draw for an art project. I would never make a mess because you don't like to fail and you know a mess to me at least then was a failure um and that's just part of my character so I I dealt with writing in the same way I would try and you know write a well-constructed interesting thoughtful narratively driven sentence followed by another one followed by another one and you know not even someone like Don DeLillo who does work that way does that you know he he redrafts you know he's you know I'm not Don DeLillo (laughs) Let's, let's, take, let's all take that from today. Yeah. I'm not done to this. Yeah. Um, so some people do work that way. Some, pe- some people that, that works. I can absolutely not work that. So I would even say don't even put chapter one. Like, don't put chapter one. Don't even think that you know where the beginning is. Start with whatever is the pressing concern of, of anything that you're thinking, whatever the thought is, whether that's a scene, whether it's a, a theme that interests you, whether it's a word... You go with that first and you, you make a mess. You make a massive mess. And then that becomes easier over time. You, you, you realise, actually, I'm not completely insane. This is actually how lots of writers work. I'll make the mess first and I'll use my conscious brain, my sort of observing, thoughtful mind to look at what I have and I'll do something with that material. That's, that's the habit I've gotten into. So I will not... I'll have an idea about what I want, obviously, in a, in a more of a tonal way rather than in a detailed understanding about what I want um but I've been very strict to develop this this practice of of being incredibly rough incredibly quick when I'm writing and then reviewing what I've done and then just doing something with what I've done because there's a point where what you write is not what you thought you would write you have to deal with the mess you've made so there's a point where you have to cut cut that cord and just deal with what you have and that's what that gets the best writing out of me I can't write with a with an idea and certainly not putting in chapter one and certainly not having a folder that says you know this project chapter one I would never I can never do that it all has so for me it all goes in one document um if I'm starting something new it's usually on my electronic typewriter (laughs) I'll start a new file or whatever um and just add to it for as long as I feel I've got the energy until it until that energy kind of winds down and I need to review what I have to find out what it is to then write more that's what I do but I, I don't even yeah I wouldn't even keep different files for chapters because you don't know that until you have a full draft and I think as well you and I it sounds are uh, I flatter myself similar um, in terms of our approaches and our, our styles and speaking to you know in the, in the process of doing these these podcast interviews writers themselves but writers who are relaying other what other writers do is that there are uh, writers, I think it was Jen Ashworth was describing a writer who would write the first two chapters, get them absolutely perfect, completely tight, before then going on to do the rest. I think the point I'm making there would be is that there are no universals, but one thing is find your thing, find what works for you, rather than having an idea of here's how to build a writing routine, is here are a number of things that you want to achieve, ways in which you might, yeah. whether it's... Um, uh, you know, dis- so I like clutter and, and distraction stuff that's just bounce off. Whereas other, but you know, I think it's Stephen King says, sit at the desk, blank room, nothing on the walls, yeah. no music. I have to have music. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are no universals other than you, mu- you. Different people will have to assemble this by themselves. And just to, to answer your question, do you know of anyone's writing routines who are really different to yours? Oh, absolutely. Um, oh, yes. My my very long term mentor and teacher, Andrew Cowan. Um, who taught me uh, at UEA and has been a wonderful um, support of my writing since then, um, so for a very, very long time. As far as I understand it, we have to have, invite him in to, speak, to ask him, but as far as I understand, he very much works in a different way and, and needs the writing to be kind of 
polished before he can carry on. You can't can't leave a mess. So we've had conversations before. I'm like, how do you do that? But it depends how you're thinking. Like I can't I can't think that way. And as soon as I put any kind of restriction down in terms of like what what the chapter should contain, I write in a very um, just in a really boring way. Like I write that thing straight away. There's no mystery. So any of any of the writing that I've come up with that's any good, it's completely by accident and it's be, it's off the cuff remarks or passages that I'm not really thinking too hard about. Um, and they're passages where I'm trying to understand what I mean. So they're inquisitive. Um, that's that's where I think my writing is best. But other people, if so, people who are um, perhaps more committed to or driven or um, excited by drama, say, so character-driven drama or cause-and-effect narratives, things like that, um, will think a lot about character. They'll, you know, they might follow the character very closely in terms of what they're doing and, you know, their actions and, and things like that. That's not my, that's not my first thought. The characters obviously are important, but they come in kind of later. It's the themes that interest me. So I think what's important for people to try is whatever. So whatever they feel. To, to, to try and forget what the rules are because there are no rules and just go with whatever interests them so if the interest in a story is something really weird like i don't know like a, a sort of semant semantics or the structure of a sentence that's just come to them and they've only got that piece of information in their head you write about that you sit down and you you know ask yourself questions talk to yourself on the page that that kind of thing because after a while i think you your imagination will start to put stories together that come from that so you know characters do come out eventually and thoughts and scenes come out eventually but it's it needs to be for me anyway it needs to be kind of organic and, and a surprise um because as soon as I have any control over something I tend to make it very boring <laughs> so um so yeah so that's that's one example but but also I think it, it can be quite confusing for people set you know starting out because you go to author events and book, book launches and things and I think by the time that an author has finished a novel and had it published and is beginning to talk about it in a public way, the way they talk about it perhaps isn't entirely truth, not truthful, not that they're being dishonest, but their, their understanding of how they have written this book is very different than the reality of how they've written this book. Um, because obviously you can't, you know, if you're talking to an audience, you have to have a reasonably comprehensive way of describing what you've done. So even my description of my writing you know, life at the beginning, that's not really accurate. I mean, that's not, it sounds like, you know, it was had intent and purpose and all this kind of stuff. That's not the experience. And that's the same with writing. It's a mess. It's a mess until it isn't. That's that's my feeling. And I, I think people do well to remember that because I think lots of people work that way. Um, and the things that hold them back apart, you know, on top of, you know, where do I find the time to do this is are perhaps worries that their approach is not how you, is not the right way that they're not being studious, they're not being sensible about it, they're not being kind of rigorous. They're being they're having too much fun, or they're being, you know... And I would say embrace, that's what it is. It's the fun. Uh, and again, I think it was um, Jen the other week who said that perfection, because a finished novel is so different from the thing that goes down on the page, particularly when you started uh, writing that, that project... And so everything you write seems like, well, I'm, I'm so far away, not even from the word count, but from the quality yeah. of a novel or this idea, particularly if you've never written one before. You yeah. know, you've got your favourite novel in mind and then the mess of mangled yes. babyish language <laughs> and cliche on the page. But is that part of the writing which is to, is to move through yeah. a, um, a imperfection yeah. um, and that it's... You know, you might be a hundred drafts away from it, but again, you just bite-sized chunk them and... Yeah, and it's to treat it kindly. And that's the thing, that's, that, that's also a different... You, you, clearly, you need a critical eye, you need to ask yourself questions, you need to solve problems. But I think you have to do it with an eye for looking for opportunity and, and with looking with kindness rather than correcting mistakes. That's really important because, obviously, every first draft is awful. It's awful. I mean, it, and this is something that... Um, I tend to do with the students I teach for the for the course, but also the writers I mentor as I give them early drafts of my writing um, for my for my first novel to see how awful it is, like to see how messy it is, because I think that's really useful to see and to understand that that's that's what it is. But you're looking, you're not going to get it straight away. You know, even if the writing is comprehensive and and it makes sense and it's grammatically correct, that won't that won't be right. Like it won't be enough. 
because you need to find it and it takes time. But that's why novels are so amazing because they're technically um, impressive and enjoyable, but they they contain time. They, they contain every, every draft, the hundreds of drafts, and that's not a joke. Like, it's hundreds of drafts <laughs> um, to get it right. Um, you have to accept that it's going to be bad for a long time. But this is why it's so important that the subject that you're writing about or the, you know, the thing that you're going for is so interesting to you because you need you need to sustain that energy that's going to keep you going through hundreds and hundreds of drafts and for me with this novel I'm writing now it's hundreds of drafts like more than that because they're not really drafts you know they're kind of like you know tangents and you you stop that and you start with this bit and then you cut to this bit and it's all it's all a mess but that that's kind of what you're signing up for um so try not to be too depressed by that because like I really seriously the the kinds of the kinds of drafts that I write are awful. Um, awful. <laughs> this is a great advert, isn't it? That's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come study with me. It's an awful, awful drafter. And just to sort of to, to finish off, I'm, I'm really interested in, um, in excuses. And of course, I'm, I do have great experience with this, is that you're, there's some part of you, um, whether it's your little ego or drives to be lazy or whatever it might be, or the fear judgment, et cetera, et cetera. There, there's this voice, there's something that's driving you that's making excuses. Well, you've got a bit of a headache. You're not in the right mood. You're not gonna have long enough. That's the thing for me is like, well, if I don't have a great run at it, if I don't have two hours, why would I bother? And I'm sure people listening and we all have all of these excuses, these kind of things that somehow magnetically repel us from sitting down and tonking out some, some, um, some work. In, in your experience, do you um, have ways of tackling that? Are there other ways that you've heard that are psyching round those sort of excuses and drives that stop us from sitting down and doing it well the one thing that's really difficult i think when you're set you're starting out is that you've got no you've got no reason to think that it's worth the time because quite often the writing isn't great when you when you're starting off with the first draft of something but when you're starting off with your kind of writing career as well you you need to learn these techniques so it is difficult because you know you're, look, you're looking at perhaps what you've written you're not very happy with it and that of course takes takes an extra effort the next time you sit down to to work on something because you're thinking well I'm not very good what's the point it is difficult and I think it really is a question of of making a habit of sitting down in ways that make the time and the writing not precious to make it fun to make it kind of natural and the same as taking the bins out just to make it something that you're not investing all of your confidence in which of course is really difficult um to understand that it takes a long time, that you're not going to get it right the first time. Um, to understand that there are forums where you can get support to keep you sitting down every time. So the courses that the uh, National Centre for Writing run do that. Mentors, such as the work I do, can do that, can keep you kind of sitting down. Those There are those things. But the, really, the, I think the thing that changed for me was is finding subject that I was so passionate about. I was running to the desk to sit down. I wasn't, I wasn't, that was the only time where I've not found excuses. It's because I'd found this sort of pattern and this thing. And I was like, oh my God, what's this? I've never written like this before. This is really important. I need to, you know, I need to get this down. It's finding that subject um, that interests you. And I, I think it's Eamon McBride um, that says a, a, a novel draft or a project draft should be like having an affair. It should be kind of illicit and, and that you, you kind of, you it, it has that, you know, makes your stomach go all funny, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so however, the, what, however that person, however the person gets to that feeling, I think is something that worth, is worth investing in. And also faith as well. You know, there's a reason why not everyone is a writer. Um, not everyone is interested in writing. But most people who do have an interest, there's a reason why they do. Um, and it's worthwhile kind of being kind to that part of themselves and kind of thinking, well, there's something in this. I'm going to pursue it. And in fact, I think with most most writers who I've worked with, um, the question of kind of improving the more you the more you write really is more down to persistence and dedication than it is. Um, necessarily you know natural talent and I would put myself in that box too I'm not you know reasonably skilled I guess because I got encouragement but it but not like one you know one of these wow she's a she's some this amazing amazingly talented um artist who must write like that's not it, it's taken a long time for me to to understand what I'm interested in and so there'll be lots of people in my situation who are kind of competent perhaps haven't found the fire in them to commit to, to it or or to research what's 
what interests them. If that's their feeling, then they need to pursue it because it does it does work. Like I'm living proof that it does work. I feel like I've listened to enough TED Talks to know that there's a <laughs> Venn diagram yes. of your raw talent, yes. your graft, yes. and that that inspiration yes. that you know, the thing that sets you on fire. So maybe that's a sort of draw yourself your Venn diagram and the thing that yes. will help you sort of get going is is the bit because again I, I likewise I'm then it's not some divine amazing art that just must spill out of me and this is yeah. perfect on um on delivery yeah. um but it's it's yeah again the mapping of those two things the yeah. sort of the the inspiration and um uh, and so on. I just quickly on the end, I wanted to revisit something that occurred to me that yeah. you you touched on earlier, which was probably useful and particularly to people in um probably most of our situations with families and mm-hmm. pets and jobs and so on is the idea of telling people that this is your your time. I, I don't want to be disturbed. This is important to me. Your role as the person not writing is important to guard me from the cat or the pets or the kids or, or the telephone for this portion of time. Is that your is that your experience? Do you have ways and methods in your writing routine? To- yes. So, I mean, what I really should do is work out of the house because that would be the main thing. But obviously, you know, with COVID and all that, all of that stuff, um, is not possible. So for me, the noise cancelling earphones, um, I think it's quite useful that the the room I work in has a very hard um, lock. So neither, well, certainly the baby can't turn the handle, but neither can my four year old. Um, so they can't just walk in. But of course, but of course they do. And but for me, that actually, I would say this has been helpful to my writing. Um, in that I obviously I've had to while my um, daughter has been young is obviously feed her regularly you know I need to be in the house to kind of do that so I the the way I've been segmenting my time is kind of you know in two hour increments because I will have to have a break every then you know every two hours to feed her so so sometimes you have to kind of incorporate the domestic life into into it's quite extreme example Um, but I would say the best thing to do is to work out of the house if you can Um, if you can't do that or if you need like me to be in the house because you need to you you do have responsibilities that you need to fulfill um then speak to your partner or speak to whoever you live with to to un- so that they understand that this is important so that when your door is closed and you're in there you're not to be disturbed um you know asking them to take the kids out to the park during this two hours that you have just trying to come up with arrangement because i mean living living with a writer is i think also a bit of a nightmare <laughs> um particularly if the person hasn't spoken to their partner about the reasons why it's important um, and that can be the cause of arguments. I mean, I live with a writer, so you know we we both have sort of understand. But it, so it requires conversation. It it requires um, uh, help from from someone else. But certainly anything that create creates a physical barrier, <laughs> like a door that won't easily open, noise cancelling earphones, working outside of the house if you can, um, and 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 just being and also you know friends. You know friends can be difficult as well your friends want to see you um is, is is finding that balance and sort of saying no I can't see you on this afternoon but we can meet up at this time you know just being in charge of it so that you don't feel that this window that you have this thing that's really special is the one thing that always goes when there's something extra that needs doing think about other time other times in the evening when you can do the ironing I don't tend to iron but if you you know are there other things that you can do um the house is always going to be a mess, so accept that, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> um, but being kind to yourself as well, because obviously you can't spend every spare minute, you know, that you're not doing other things, writing. You need time to relax, you need time to read, you need time to do things that inspire you, you need to watch films, you need to feed yourself. Um, so don't be too rigorous in scheduling that time either, because that won't help either it's finding a balance well that is is fantastic advice and and believe me i'm not not eating and feeding myself i think that's fairly (laughs) evident megan thank you so much what just a stack of awesome advice um that people can sort of put into their thinking and start to try different things and push in different directions to get themselves into that um that positive cycle of having done it once twice three times suddenly you're really rolling with it and your story has momentum you're sort of finding your groove with with writing routine so uh, that's fantastic thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. 
If you have questions or want to get in touch, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Writer Centre. And you'll find us on Facebook by searching National Centre for Writing. Don't forget to sign up to our weekly newsletter by visiting nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk and clicking the orange drop down box on the homepage. As a UK registered charity, we rely on the generosity of our supporters to make our work possible. You can make a donation over on the website today by hitting the support us button in the top nav. Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review us because it helps other writers to find the podcast. Thanks again. Keep writing and we'll catch you on the next episode.